It's time to once again travel through time. And who knows where we'll end up, but more likely than not, it'll be a day from now talking about the wrestling that we have to watch. <laughs> Are you ready to travel through time? I'm ready to get out of this pitch, whatever you're doing here. Here we go. We are in the future once again. That was it. That was it. That wasn't it's good. It's taking less time these days. Oh, that's kind of cool. All right. Well, we are now. Uh -huh. Now we're in the future. That was a false start. And we're going to talk about AEW Collision, which had the misfortune of going against SummerSlam. Well, boy, howdy. I'll tell you what. Between SummerSlam and Collision, for those of us who are not just inclined, but actually mandated to watch this stuff. It was a long night and morning. at six hours, six plus hours of wrestling action. But we're going to talk about Collision first, and before we talk about the television program, let me begin by saying that it was a great thing that FTR and Punk, and I'm sure Tony blessed it, Tony Khan, and whoever else was involved for the what they did for Dennis Condry after the show was over with. And I know that it obviously wasn't on television, so not everybody's seen it, but they put the clip out of after the show went off the air, they had uh, FTR were in the ring and they brought Punk out, and Dennis and his wife Teresa were sitting in the front row because this weekend is the Charlotte Fan Fest, and they're They've been down there for that, but I'm sure FTR invited them to come down to Greenville and, and watch the matches. How far from Charlotte is Greenville? Uh, well, I don't know about time these days. We used to do it an hour and a half. Traffic is worse, but it's 105 miles right down the interstate. So that was, you know, that was... Anyway, they recognized Dennis and brought him into the ring and... You know, uh, everybody gave him a nice round of applause because it's Greenville, South Carolina. It's old Crockett territory. It's, you know, a, a prime place to do something like that. But when I saw Dax enter on the TV show, he turned around and I said, well, he's got lover boy Dennis on the back of his vest. And then when, it, when he turned around, I realized, no, that was actually Dennis's vest. He was wearing Dennis's vest. So he wore that and got that on the program, and then they brought Dennis in the ring to say a couple things after, you know, after the show when they do their thank you fan interview thing that they all do. Did you see that clip? I saw only a little bit of it. I didn't get to watch the whole thing. And they, <laughs> Punk somehow I don't I joined it in progress I guess because Punk was wearing a cowboy hat and. That was an odd visual. I don't know exactly where he got that or what was going on there. But anyway, thank you guys, everybody who had something to do with recognizing Dennis there in, in front of the crowd. Now, should we talk about the television program? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. And if, even though I'm going to have some things to say again, and it had the misfortune of going against SummerSlam, but this was the the premier wrestling program of the week, just because it, it comes the closest to being a wrestling program. Uh, but unfortunately I felt so bad. All right, let's go into it. The program and this is collision for August the 5th started with the, the promos about the main matches. We had punk, uh, his match against Starks, where he said he's going to separate the pretenders from the contenders because he's the real world champion. And Starks responded. And that Prince Nana got a chance to actually talk. We heard he has a voice. Uh, it was with Brian Cage and Big Bill because they're facing FTR, and then FTR rounded it out because they're in South Carolina. And then we got Elton John, Ian Riccoboni, and Nigel McGuinness in that order. And then. The first match was Big Bill and Brian Cage against FTR. And I swear to God, I said, okay, at the start of this, I'm thinking, can they do it? Because Cage, I think, is hopeless. He looks wonderful, but to be left to his own devices, eh. Big Bill is looking better. 
except for the name and the, I shouldn't say looking better. He, his work is better. He seems like somebody you could do something with, but the name and the just what he wears is just horrendous, right? And now that Cage is wearing a mohawk and face paint, he looks even... there. That's a hat on a hat, on that body and that face and that fucking thing, and, all, and he's flipping and doing backflips. You can't tell what the fuck his deal is supposed to be. But I said, okay, maybe FTR can do something here. And Dax came out with Dennis's vest on and everything, and they got the FTR chance going on, and Cash hugged his mother in the front row, which I believe is the proper use of a mother. I think a baby face should be allowed to hug their mother before they get in the ring and have the match. We'll come back to mother. And... <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like Anthony Perkins saying it that way. <laughs> mother! And, you know, then they start having the match, and it was going brilliantly. They're putting the other guy's size and strength over, but Cash has a leapfrog like Buzz Sawyer. And, you know, it, 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 again, Dax and Cash are just so technically proficient, but also they they kept the guys doing simple shit that they, you know, that they could look big and strong in, and then Dax and Cash would double tackle or outmaneuver or whatever and and be a little quicker. And they were laying their shit in. And basically, I wrote FTR making this work. It's the best that Cage has ever looked. And the match is making sense. And then, you know, they did the break spot where Big Bill just press slammed Cash and dropped him over the top rope on Dax. And that was a decent break spot, and we were 11 minutes into the show by that point, so I'm invested in this. It's not like we saw two minutes of bing, 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 and five minutes of fucking Massingill ads, right? So when they come back, they're getting heat on cash on the floor. And then they did the deal where mom slaps Bill. But in the words of Frank Spaceman Hickey, too cartoon, too cartoon, because she was smiling. She was having the greatest time. She was, she was having the, the greatest time. time when her son was getting mauled in front of her. She couldn't contain herself. I wish we could declare a moratorium on that. And, you know, Stu and Helen, it worked because they'd been in the business for 50 years, right? But most of the time, the family and, and Michelle, Cody's mom, has done well. And we've just seen her in action. That's the thing. It's not like seeing a mom in the front row slap a wrestler or something we haven't seen just recently. This was not revolutionary, nor was it a big match where it had been built up for weeks and there was a grudge and the heels had said bad things about the family. Is because they were close to home. But anyway, having said that, they got some good heat on cash. I said, Big Bill looks better than ever. The match is making sense. Bill takes a nice bump into the post. Cash, German suplexes cage and fights up and hits a hot tag. And Dax comes in with great punches. Boom, 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 boom. And then they hit the top rope bulldog that the Steiners used to do perfectly yeah, look great. as they had done this sequence where bing, 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 the comeback and they shit can big bill and they pick up cage. Dax picked him up effortlessly bending over in that big meathead, right? And they hit the bulldog perfect and the cover and the people are there. One, two, he kicked out. And you can go back and watch. If they had got the three count there, the people would have gone absolutely ballistic. And it would have been a great, almost a perfect match. And everything that they needed to do would have been accomplished. But they went on. So at some point, here in the next 10 or 15 seconds, FTR try to go for the spike pile driver on cage. And he picks Dax up underneath him, catches Cash coming off the ropes with a crossbody, and 
does the sack of shit throw to the both of them right after the bulldog off the top that he just took? How, it, 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 and it's like they started having another match. Yeah, I'm not saying the spot wasn't right, but they could have done it two minutes into the fucking match, not right after they nearly decapitated him and he was selling. So then, at that point, Cage suplexed Cash, but Big Bill came back in and goozled Dax and choke slam and suplexed him. And then they just started doing shit. And it wasn't really as good as the shit they'd been doing, so the crowd lost interest kind of in the match, but instead they were chanting FTR like, yeah, let's get back to what you were doing a minute ago. And then... I don't know what happened because Big Bill set Cash up on the top turnbuckle and then turned around and Cash had to more or less climb up on his shoulders. But he's on his shoulders, but Dax jumped up from behind and pulled him down and Cage was on the top rope and Big Bill went to charge with a double clothesline, but Cash ducked and Dax didn't. But it looked like maybe that Dax was surprised that fucking Big Bill clotheslined him. And because he tatered Dax and then he turned around and grabbed Cash, tried to grab him by the neck like for a choke slam. But Cash, who had ducked the clothesline, thought that I guess he was going to hit him and sold it like a punch. And I wrote, I don't know what spot they're fucking up here. But. <sighs> Big Bill clothesline Cash to the floor and Cage did a dive, which, which again, they've already completely lost the plot after the Bulldog. And then they started getting a little fucking steam on Cash again, but they shoved the heels together and hit the shatter machine on Cage one, two, three. So the finish where they were going to win was on the fucking guy that they Bulldogged. Nothing would have changed except the match wouldn't have gone from perfect to what the fuck is going on here if they'd have just done it then. I don't know why they didn't do it then. I don't know why that they thought, even when they were talking it over, that it would have been good to do the things they did after they didn't do the thing they should have done. What do you think, Brian? I agree with you completely. I thought it was a pretty good match that went too long even before it got really sloppy which it did my thought was this is a match unlike the FTR matches against Gin and Juice for instance we kind of know who's going to win there's no question that it's not going to be Big Bill and Brian Cage with Prince Nana winning the tag titles in South Carolina right so for that reason I think it needs to be a good action packed match but it doesn't need to be a long match doesn't need to be overly competitive. There don't need to be so many near falls when it's guys who are clearly not going to win. Then you're just trying to create something that doesn't need to be there. Brian Cage is an example of someone I want to like. And at times I do. You know, this match had some of the best clotheslines I've seen in a long time. It's such a weird compliment. But Cage and FTR lay them in and the other guys take them hard and go down and they look great and they sound great. You don't really see that too often because you don't see big muscular guys. Cage is wearing face paint. To honor Sting, I guess, because there was a giant scorpion on his pants too. The heel honoring Sting, I, I assume, I don't even know if the commentators ever said that. I think he looks good with the face paint because he looks like a big roided up 80s wrestler, but it shouldn't be happy colors. It should be something dark. <laughs> it like, was very pastel, wasn't it? Yeah, early Barbarian, early Road Warriors, T. Joe Khan, something like that. Not friendly surfer sting. You don't want to look like you're welcoming to people if you're the heel. But you see, you know, you know what? To be honest, that's the kind of 80s throwback I don't really... I guess because I had to live through so many Road Warrior impersonators and so many people doing the face paint because the handful of guys in the 80s, Ultimate Warrior, Road Warriors, Warlord, Barbarian, you know, had success with it. We saw everybody had their face painted. And now it, it kind of looks 
Like, look, that guy's cosplaying as the Road Warriors. I mean, it has to be something different. It can't be a direct ripoff, but he came out there again. A scorpion on his trunks and sting face paint, and he's on the heel team in South Carolina. And I agree about Big Bill. <laughs> Big Bill looks like he's getting better in the ring. He looks like he's in the best shape I've seen him in. And I'm sure he probably wants to get back to WWE anytime soon. <laughs> so, uh, should have ended sooner. Good competitive match, but you knew what the outcome was going to be and was more like a fan-friendly match for the house, I guess. Well, and I see your point, and I'll raise you a point. Now, I see your point about, yeah, they should, FTR should be stronger against a middle card team, but if it was a really great fucking working team, I would give them the creative license to go into more things. But they knew... They should have known that they were, uh, you know, going to Las Vegas on that. The longer it went with the greener guys, the more chance they had of something not going right. And again, I think that's, uh, they're trying to be too giving and they're trying to put together classic finishes to matches that don't need to be classics and they run off and leave the other teams. And in, in some cases, not in the gin and juice case, but in, there was another example, God, who was it? This was probably several months ago now where they had a really good match going FTR with somebody else, but then they pressed their luck and tried to make it too complicated and ran off, and left the other team. I can't remember, but yeah, that, I can't remember either. That is something that happens sometimes because they just, they, they get enthusiastic. And speaking of enthusiasm, mine was waning considerably when they did a promo afterwards and said of all the titles they won and allocades that they've been showered with and et cetera, they got one thing left to do. And then they say, young bucks. And I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God. How about we finish our business at Wembley Stadium? All right, if 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 FTR defends successfully against the Bucks and they win the <laughs> two out of three trilogy, that ain't happening. Then I will be more than fucking happy to suffer through that match. But if this is a goddamn now they've signed again, so we got to have belts back. And when FTR has gin and juice and has fucking at least a number of people now that they can work with prominently instead of being ashamed of getting a ring with, are the Cucamonga kids going to try to fuck this up again? I don't know about try to fuck this up. There's a difference between trying and just fucking things up. I think one of two things are going to happen. Either the Bucks are going to win the belts in Wembley Stadium so they could tell their grandkids that they won the tag team championships in Wembley Stadium from the big bad FTR, who were the bullies. And of course, they got their new deal. And FTR got a deal, you know, a little bit before this. But FTR got a new deal, too. And they want to play ball. And the only way you're going to play ball with the Bucks is if the Bucks go over. The only other option, and it's kind of the Hail Mary, FTR goes over because Punk interferes. Bucks got their new contract. They're willing to finally do some business, but... Well, that ain't happening. Yeah, I got my fingers uh, crossed on that one. Yeah, I've, I'll tell you where I'm putting my finger on that one. That's the problem. FTR, and the truth is we don't know what that giant crowd will react to. Will be a crowd that loves FTR? Will be a Bucks crowd? Will be a dueling chant crowd? But FTR is having another year where they're tag team of the year. And I think it's probably a safe bet that another tag team doesn't like that, and they're going to do what they can to change that. Jesus Christ. Well, you know what? Uh, uh, our fans in the UK, across the pond there, in the vicinity and parameters of Wembley Stadium, this is something, we, a question we have not asked those people. What is the, the majority of the wrestling fan base in the United Kingdom these days? Is it the cosplay, trampoline, cowboy, buckaroos, cucamonga kids type of, you know, hey, let's let all our friends play and we like pockets type of fans? Or is it the, hey, FTR and Gin and Juice just had the best tag team match of modern times and we like actual fucking pro wrestling done by grown adult men crowd? Which, which side is winning that war over there in the United Kingdom? 
We don't. I'd know. like to hear some feedback. I will say this though: if there was ever a chance that the Bucks would do business, what better way and what better place to kick it off than Wembley, knowing that you got to heat things up for a pay per view the next week in Chicago? Oh yeah, that's right. They got to come back the next week. Well, you know, fifty what? bucks a pop. Yeah. Maybe then they can just, they can win it in Wembley just because they want to tell their kids and grandkids and and take pictures and take selfies because they're children. But then they could lose it back the next week in Chicago where, you know, they're probably more likely to be on the other side of the fence because it's Chicago and that's Punk's hometown. I can't go to Chicago. My horse is sick. I, I, come on. You can't mean to tell me that you think that one of those plastic horses that you put a dime in in front of the drugstore <laughs> is going to get sick and Maybe. it's the only one that either one of those boys have ever been on so anyway um they did a starks punk package to explain the the main event tonight on collision and then there was tony shivani and the first thing you see is he's with juice robinson and that big six foot tall jay white cardboard cutout and Juice did like two lines and stole the show. And when when Jay White came in and started speaking, I was pissed off because I was like, he was doing the promo that I wish Juice was still doing. And the Gun Boys are in there too, is because they're the Bang Bang Gang. But I love Juice Robinson. Please give him a live promo in the ring for a couple minutes so we can see what's going on there fully. Um, I agree. He. <laughs> Got personality. Anyway, the TBS title was on the line. Mercedes Martinez challenging Chris Statlander. And okay, I'm going to watch this because not only have we said that Statlander's looking like a star these days, but also Mercedes Martinez is a veteran. She knows how to work. This is not going to be, you know, Penelope pit stop and the fucking Twinkle Toes is Dagum uh, Joshi crew, right? So they started with a fight, and Statlander is is stronger. Obviously, you know, she's bigger, but Mercedes Martinez doesn't take any any guff. I think they started going a little fast at the beginning, but they settled down. And Again, it was a serious fight, and now you can tell who the heel is and who the babyface is. Mercedes Martinez is ripping at the face, and Chris Statlander selling. It, it was a match. Imagine that. They went through a break, and when they came back, Statlander was was coming back and missed a crossbody off the apron to the floor, <laughs> splat, which didn't look too comfortable. Uh, but she ended up taking back over on Mercedes and throwing her back in. And boom, 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 they went through a couple of false finishes, a couple of two counts with moves. And then Statlander got a O'Connor roll up and not a bridge, but a bow backwards. I don't she didn't go all the way back in the bridge, but it got the point across one, two, three. And before we talk about what happened afterwards, they can, we were just talking about this. And now we they can have good girls matches if they concentrate on the handful that can produce and be serious and look credible. And there was nothing wrong with this thing. And it's you know it it if they would concert if they'd weed out their roster and concentrate on we pick these three or four top girls and we're going to rotate whoever's going to fucking put them over. They could get some individual women over instead of the women's division. Your thoughts. I don't disagree with what you're saying. And I think that's kind of, you know, when you talk about the post-match, like Willow Nightingale, there's an example of them getting a woman over as opposed to the division. And she stands out and she's different. I think with Statlander, it can be that too. You know, I think with the Britt Baker crew or whatever you want to call it everyone over there unfortunately we've seen a lot of people hit their limits of what they can really do i think what they can really do in the ring in a lot of cases from ruby soho to Britt baker but with a lot of these other women whether it's a statlander who just continually improves 
from the first day we saw her, not just in gimmick, but in terms of work, physicality, everything in there. Willow Nightingale, Mercedes Martinez has always been good. Uh, it's just nice when she finally gets an opportunity. But, uh, you know, I'm high on Willow Nightingale. Sky Blue, you know, despite everyone just wanting to look at her butt, she's not bad in there for someone who has very little or no she's experience. Very, she's good for that age. For that age. There's very a few, good. There's a few people like that, and you just need someone that can work with them and develop them. But the problem is, there was a lot of wrestling on. This was one of the matches I hit fast forward through a little bit. Ah. Even though I like, I'm, you know, I'm a fan of Statlanders and Mercedes is good every time I see her. I still, that's the problem in a lot of cases with the women's division. It's good that you can have a match here. and It'll be a hard hitting match, but is it a part of something bigger? And I said this to you a few weeks back because someone sent me something. WWE, whatever you want to say about any of the women on that roster, they're all working with someone. They have a feud with someone. We may not like their programs, but they're programmed with someone. Every everyone. Yeah. AEW, it's just matches, and then people running around. <laughs> That's all it is. Like who's well, who's Statlander feuding with? Well, at least now we may get the start of something because on Collision, imagine this: after the match, Mercedes Martinez gets back on Statlander and gets some heat on her, and Diamante. Remember, she was with LAX three years ago. Which I didn't even know she was still there. She comes out and confronts Mercedes Martinez, or confronts, yes, Mar Mercedes Martinez, and then jumps on Statlander and starts beating her up too. So then Willow comes out, and the heels bail out when Willow comes to even the odds, but they're going to have a tag match next week. Imagine that. If this was dynamite, we wouldn't see any of these people for another three months. So maybe they're trying. Yeah, and I want to see that because I like Statlander, I like Willow, and uh, they're both from Long Island, so I have to root for them. Oh, good Lord. So we'll see how that goes. All right, well, Tony Schiavone was with Tony Storm, and did you see this interview? I did, and I'm going to reiterate to you what I've been saying. Tony Storm is a star. She's great on these promos. She doesn't need any group or anyone. She needs to be on her own. She's fantastic. She's upset she lost the belt, and she's basically having a nervous breakdown, and she's flipping her lid. Have I lost it? I didn't read it. And this was great. It was different, and she had some personality. Perhaps maybe she can forget where her other friends in this group are and just be on her own, and we would be more interested and see more of her. And then we came to Samoa Joe versus Serpentico. And I swear to God, as I was writing the words, this better be one tackle pancake, Joe threw him up in the air and dropped him down and slapped the choke on, and he tapped out in like 10 seconds. So that was perfect. That's what it needed to be, yeah. Yeah. And then Joe has a chance to do the promo, which he speaks with a conviction in his voice. And he's got, he sounds like he means what he says. And he's the king of television. He's taken one of these meaningless belts that everybody's got from Ring of Honor or AEW or New Japan or AAA or Mickey Mouse Club. But he's making it work for him by tying it into his promos and claiming something and being a fucking heel and he wants an opponent for Wembley and then he switched gears to punk and he a roll up is not good enough for our legacy and he wants a rematch with punk and if punk doesn't want to give him one then next week he'll be here to convince him so I'm again if we saw this on Wednesday night we'd never see Joe again for a month and a half so I'm Anxious to see what goes on here. Should they replay more of this show on Wednesday than normal because of SummerSlam being against it? Possibly. And, and plus, it would be a bonus because it would be less of an actual Wednesday night that we'd have to watch, a Wednesday night show we'd have to watch. And that wouldn't be a bad idea, at least a, a package where it brings everybody up to date on the happenings. And speaking of bringing up to date on Andre did a voiceover of a package about his issue over his mask and the House of Black. I don't have any idea what he said, but he was serious about it. But could you, I cannot, I'm not even being funny now. 
This has gone past a bit. I don't know what the fuck he's saying. Yeah. I, at the first half of it, I thought he was speaking Spanish, and then I recognized one of the words. I don't know what he was saying, and I don't know what his problem is. He got his mask back. Who is he doing his promo against? The House of Black? He already beat them. Well, but he's not satisfied, but I don't know why. Uh, anyway, then Tony did a sit down. Tony is around. He's They put him in the spot you told him to put him in. But he's doing every interview now. He sat down with the acclaimed and Billy Gunn's boots. And they've tried to give Billy his boots back, but he won't take them. He's retired. He feels like it was his fault they lost the tag title. He got beat twice. He says he's done. And now they're, they're saying, well, uh, Billy, we don't want you to give up. Maybe we failed you in the trios division. The trios, Bowens cried, and Caster looks way too nerdy wearing his glasses. Did you see that? He looked like a fucking kid in goddamn in a class to be an accountant. I mean, they were uh, sympathetic baby faces in this way, so... No, they were fucking sniveling fucking nerds. Caster, the fucking rapper that comes out and has all these double and triple entendres and insinuates things and these risque raps is wearing glasses and sitting there all, you know, all nerdy. And there's Bowens legitimately emotional and crying about everything that daddy ass did for him. I think they're trying to get the acclaimed away from Billy because they've got to get away from the scissoring and they got to get away from daddy ass because they got to get back to the acclaimed and casters rapping and people liking them for them because Billy's 60 for fuck's sake. But in doing so they're instead of these cool fucking rappers, they sound like a couple of fucking whiny little bitches, don't they? I don't want to use those words, but I've questioned... I already did! I've questioned the booking of the Acclaim for a while and how they've been presented after getting over as cool baby faces. They're not cool baby faces anymore. And the idea they need to get Billy Gunn to join them again to get their mojo back, I don't like that either. And they're talking about the trio's belt, so it's not like they're moving on, and they're holding Billy Gunn's boots. They're holding his booth? What do you mean? Until he gives them their deposit back or what the... F well, he keeps trying... They keep trying to return the boots and he says, no, you keep them. What's wrong well, with then these they're, they're not. They're not holding them. He don't want them. Well, the point is I do not... I like, don't want it. You can't have it. He's too... Right. I don't like the uh, booking of the acclaimed and I haven't in a while. They have to do something different and, you know, I, I hate... Every time I think somebody needs to do something different, I say they have to turn heel and everyone kills me. I'm not even saying it's that with the acclaim, but they need some kind of edge on them again. Not like we're emo rappers. Well, that's what I was thinking with Billy retiring that they were doing in terms of, okay, let's focus on these guys as a team and Caster's rap as the star of the entrance and et cetera, and get away from the scissoring and the daddy ass, which was funny, but long-term ain't going to be for these guys. I thought that's what they were starting to do, but now they're, they look more sniveling and craven than I, anyway. Moving along. Here comes the judgment day. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I'm being what? told it's the House of Black. <laughs> Come um, on. No, they're not doing the thing where they appear and disappear. They're just, they're, they got the spooky lighting. That's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm slightly kidding now. Uh, the House of Black is not as blecky as it was when they were casting spells on people and, I don't know, fucking... Rocking chairs. Burning babies <laughs> at the stake. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> These fucking Satanists. You know, they they should have done a live on-location video with Julia Hart in Salem, Massachusetts. We're evil and demonic, but we speak in a very relaxing way. Yes. <laughs> That's... That's how all the English Shakespearean actors played Lucifer. To lull you. Well, you never know. It's the calm ones you gotta watch, Brian. It's the calm ones you gotta watch. 
But for the world six-man title, do you have to watch the House of Black take on Darius Martin, Action Andretti, and Shoddy Lee Johnson? And they still have not explained why Lee Johnson is apparently so shoddy. He didn't look that unkempt to me. He looked like he was grooming himself properly, but they're always calling him shoddy. This was the nine o'clock hour. They, I don't understand. I don't understand. The House of Black, yes. Six-man title, okay, but... And I mean, I know they got to build these guys up. I wouldn't have put that on the nine o'clock hour. I'd have done something. I don't know what. But anyway, they announced the the baby faces get to pick one of the rules, right? In the house rules matches for the six man title, and they picked Julia Hart is banned from ringside, and the fans booed the baby face is getting the heel manager booted away from ringside. This is where we're at these days. Is she um, more over than the rest of the House of Black? Well, look at the audience. Everybody wants to look at Julia Hart, especially those folks. Um, what, are you, what are you saying about the good people of Greenville? I'm saying about the good people of AEW. I'm, is, you know, they don't see a lot of Julia Hart every day, those people. For the kind of people who like that kind of thing, she's the kind of thing those people like. No, she's beautiful and gorgeous, but here's another thing. She's not done anything to make anybody believe she's evil or make anybody mad at her. And then honestly, since they like the heels just as much as they like the baby faces because they know this is all a bunch of fucking hokey horseshit to begin with, how are you going to get any heat on anybody? But that's a story for another time because the House of Black won this match in about 10 minutes, during which point I went to get strawberry cheesecake ice cream. What did you think about their match? I thought fast forward. I knew who was going to win. I, I You didn't think ice cream? No, I didn't have any more ice cream because uh, I actually wanted to order it earlier in the day and Suzanne said I ordered too much ice cream earlier in the week and I listened to her. Ordered it? Yeah, why, a, why don't you have some on hand in your freezer? Well, I have a place that makes fresh, a creamery nearby, and they bring oh, over fresh stuff. <laughs> What's your problem? <laughs> You're right over there? You have a creamery. Yes. You have a creamery over there. And every time you pass that creamery, there's old, old Farmer Jones out there in the field, and he's milking one of them cows. And then, and one of those days, you said, you know what? I'm going to get some of that fresh milk. And you went in that field and you milked that cow and you drank that milk right out of the udders. And then you went to old Farmer Jones and you said, I'd like to pay you for the fresh milk that I just milked out of that cow over there. And he said, what cow? All I see is a bull. It's like you were there. So then Tony Schiavone was in the back with Powerhouse Hobbs. Boy, you want to talk about a promo where it begins like, all right, and then instantly, like, oh, fuck. Yeah, instantly. It's like, ah. Oh. Because he's standing there with Hobbs, and as he's, Tony is doing his opening statement or his opening question, QT comes in before Hobbs even says a word. And, of course, kicks Tony out and gives Hobbs the biggest, gaudiest, fake, obviously, you know, imitation gold chain ever and made a big pitch that he had fairly well memorized for a big match that I didn't get the point of what he's saying. I'm going to get you a big match, but he didn't say what the match was or really where it was or who it was against. Right. Right. And uh, the pitch is I'll get you a big match. And if you'll just come back and love me and Hobbs takes the fake gold, it would have been even better if he just said, Dude, I'm from the hood. I see this as fucking cheesy, you know, from a mile away. But he takes the gold and blows QT off. And meanwhile, the girl, uh, QTV girl, was in the middle of them with her cartoony fake faces. And there you go. So Hobbs is still trapped in whatever the fuck this bizarro world is where people think that it's a good idea to be interacting with the people he's interacting with. 
I think Tony should turn Rampage into a show for like book all these guys, QT and his crew, not Powerhouse Hobbs, everyone else. Jeff Jarrett and his crew, the Hardys. Just put all of these people. Wait, on. how come Jay Lethal has to get trapped over there on Poverty Row working for Monogram Studios? He needs to choose better friends, I guess. He I don't think he's picked. I think he I think he got placed there. Well, I think they should put all these people on one show and just let them stay there and not interfere on the other shows because every time QT shows up on these shows, everyone groans. And it's holding Powerhouse Hobbs back. Because even when he eventually kicks the shit out of QT, who really wants to see that now? You just want him to move on. You don't even want him to get even. There's nothing to get even over. Just move on. Yeah, I don't think anybody wants to pay to see somebody kick the shit out of QT. I think they only want to do it themselves. If they can't do it personally, they don't give a shit. Anyway, speaking of kicking the shit out of people, what was it, family night? Was it bring your fucking kids to work night? What is going on? Tony Schiavone was in the back with Christian Cage and Dino Douche and Christian's daughter. He, I have no reason to doubt that he said it's my daughter. I have not met his, his daughter's like, what was she, six years? You know, You know about estimating the ages of Children, what is it, like seven years for every adult year, or how is that? I have no idea what you're talking about. How old was the little girl? I have no idea. Well, how old do you estimate? If you were in the at the county fair and she came up and the you're in the fair. guessing booth where you guess your weight, guess your height, guess your age, what would you guess her age would be? Based on, You've seen little girls of that age in the wild. If we were at the county fair, I'd be buying some Zeppelis. I would say between the ages of six and nine, if I had to guess. All right. So she's a very delightful little young lady. Maybe seven and nine. Seven and nine. Between the ages of seven and nine. Or she could be big for her age and be five and a half. We're not sure. But anyway, he's, she's standing there in front of him. And he's talking about being a role model for children like his daughter there, unlike Darby Allen, who's a, you know, delinquent or whatever. And then... Obviously, she's not a professional actress, but the kid has gotten a cue, I guess, from somewhere to go, Daddy, can I have the belt, or can I hold the belt? And he tells her, no, you didn't win it, so you can't hold it. And then, go, go find your mother. And as she toddles off, he says, hey, security, she's not credentialed. Kick her out of the building. <sighs> the reason why I love Christian is because he comes off as such a Bond villain heel, and he's not being funny about it. He's got a straight face, and he's saying horrible things to people, and he's very well-spoken as he does it. And he's a better worker than most people in the fucking roster, even if his age and or injuries, he don't want to do it every fucking week. And he makes the, Dino, the, dinos the dinosaur, the dinosaur palatable, Dino. And I would believe it was some random little girl. But I don't believe, why did he have to do that? I don't believe that he, wa he wants security to kick his daughter out of the building. I don't actually want to think he has a daughter. Because then that indicates that he's a married man and that makes him a human being and I want him to be a fucking Bond villain on my goddamn television. This was the hokiest he's been. Yes, he's never hokey. And suddenly, here came the hoke train. But however, you know, can I just say something? You, please brought up, do. you brought up the families. You had Cash's mother, you had Christian's daughter. During the FTR match, they said there were, I think they said a hundred family members in the crowd, but that sounds excessive. But family. Not for the Carolinas. No, it doesn't. Apparently on Rampage, Trent's mom showed up again in the minivan. Oh, Jesus Christ. In the middle of that garbage match they had, which I heard was. I, people, it's one of those matches people are like, Jim has to watch it because he'll hate it. <sighs> I don't want to give that type of thing any more publicity. I know, but apparently it's family week in AEW is the point. Well, fam, here's what came next. Jay White with Juice and the guns in his corner against Metallic. And I wrote... I, <laughs> I like Jay and, and Juice as a team, but I want to see Juice. I want to see Juice wrestle. I want to hear Juice talk. Um, 
Uh, but Jay White is a good heel. He milked uh, throwing the T-shirt to the crowd and then threw it to the to the guns. But here's the thing: how many generic masked luchadors and or imitation luchadors are there in AEW? Counting the legitimate luchadors that are of Mexican descent and the imitation luchadors that are from various places in fucking Florida and Alabama, you got Serpentico, you got Fago del Sol, you got Vikingo, you got Commander, you got Gravity, you got Metallic, you got the Lucha Brothers. Have I, you've, you've, Serpentico? Did you say Serpentico? I said Serpentico first. It was so long ago, that whole long <laughs> list, you forgot about it. That's right. Andre, at least, only has his mask on for certain occasions. He's got a face, even though we don't know what he's saying. You can identify, but all the, it, instead of an attraction, it's just confusing. They're all tiny. They're all in the multicolored outfits. It's a fucking cultural thing in Mexico, and the masks are trademarks, and they're emblematic of that person, but to the American audience watching this television program when they are just intermittently sprinkled throughout without ever being particularly focused on, except for the Lucha Brothers, you can tell one of them from the other, not by their work, but by their outfit, it just looks like a bunch of guys in Lucha outfits running around at fucking Halloween. So I don't think that it's the way to get Jay White over as a main event heel level, whether he's a single or a tag, when he can hardly beat a small, generic, faceless gymnast. So that's my thoughts on that match. There's nothing else we could add to that match. All righty. But it's time for our main event, because that's the thing. They'll get... Collision, it's a wrestling-flavored program. They'll get you at the start with something pretty good. They will sprinkle a few things in in the middle, and you know they're going to produce by the time the show is over with with the main event. And it was nice to see Jim Ross back on television. He's had probably, apparently, now we find out the fall where he bashed his face in was due to a severe sciatica where his legs gave way because I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what was going on you remember two years ago, Brian, when I couldn't walk for two weeks from bending over? Yeah. That was an, a flare-up of an injury that I had from my sciatic nerve. And I don't know if I would have even, even though it was very painful and awkward, I don't know if that would even be severe sciatica if a doctor diagnosed it. So severe, he's been miserable, I guarantee you. So he's had a bad back, in, a possible infection on his radiation wound from his skin cancer and fell and gave himself a concussion. So he's been off for a few weeks, but that's what he, they should do. Bring him back and put him with a professional announced team that doesn't involve sock face, sucking all the oxygen out of the room and let him do the main event. And that I thought was very well done. And Riggy Steamboat, the special referee, on the floor, as we found out. Uh, his hair is gray, but he still looks great for his... What, Ricky is 70 now, or gotta be, right? Has to be. So, he looks good. But as we mentioned, or as I just mentioned, he's the referee on the floor, and they had a regular referee in the ring. And I don't know that the regular referee in the ring did anything that Ricky couldn't have done, to be honest with you. But uh, but it was a long match. So but I probably find out Steamboat's got better cardio than everybody involved. Anyway, here comes Starks and gets lots of cheers and you know accolades, and then like a Mussolini in South Carolina. Here comes Punk, and he again has a ball milking the various reactions. And he he actually he can he can play with them because at one point in this match a couple of subtle things he was doing 
was making Starks the baby face and getting the people to boo him even more than the ones that were. But by the end of the thing, Starks ends up being the heel and they're cheering punk for helping Steamboat. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. JR made the point that I think they, they need to start making on all the programs, not just Saturday night, that Punk is the real world champion because nobody has beaten him. And on Wednesday night, since MJF is so popular now and the Buckaroo fans are more inclined to watch that program, that'll just get him more heat with those people. Either they did the big dueling chance, and that's this match. Their main events on Collision have an atmosphere. People want to see it. They want, they're not just wanting to see, we want tables, you know, we want filing cabinets, we want a credenza. They want someone in the match to do something positive, right? There's a difference in just watching a fucking display and being in support of somebody. So I don't think we need to go uh, play by play through the match because it was a long one too. They put in time on these main events, which helps that the other matches on the program are not inordinately burdensomely long. But it made sense. They wrestled. And the way that the match was constructed, uh, they wrestled at first, then the tempers flared and they traded slaps with each other. And But even like when, when Starks would do the steamboat arm drags and Punk would take them and then he slid out afterwards. That was a subtlety to get the people behind Starks. Punk slid out. It's just little things. And, you know, they went back and forth through a couple of different breaks. And they had a heck of a match, except at one point, it, was it... It Starks usually gets a little excited in some of these big match situations, isn't it? Has he done this before? The, has he done what before? Well, I mean, get a little excited and and blank out, lose track. I don't remember get that going happening. Too quick or whatever. There's, I think there's been a time or two, but nevertheless, boom, 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 Punk goes up to the top rope and is there for a second. And is there, and there, Starks is down, right, selling. But he's up there, and then you see his lips move. He's telling Starks something, right? And then he says it again. And at that point, Starks gets up and starts coming in for a cross body off the top rope. Apparently, it was supposed to be Starks was going to stagger up, Punk was going to cross body him, Starks was going to roll through and hook the leg, one, two, whatever, false finish, right? But Punk's up there, and he said something. He said it again, and Sully Starks bolts to his feet, and Punk comes off with the cross body. And Starks was already close, and Punk didn't look like he was trying to get any height. He looked like he was just trying to come off and come down on him. But Starks took another little stutter step in and then raised his arms when he realized that Punk was going to go over the top of his head. So Punk went over the top of Starks' head, but Starks caught him with his right arm, and it took them fucking both down. And so Stark still rolled through, but when he rolled over, he came up knees first on Punk's fucking face, apparently, it looked like. Two count. So besides that, which was unfortunate, they really had all this shit going. And boom, boom, boom. I think at, at one point, did you see where... Ricky was doing the rope walk and Punk jerked him off the top rope across his shoulders into the GTS position, but Starks dropped behind. He should have put more, and I'm being this minute now because these guys are worth critiquing. It's not like it's just a complete fucking mess and there's no hope. He should have put more oomph in shoving Punk off into the post because Punk went and took a great post, but Starks just gave him a little shove and then ran to the opposite corner so he could get in position for the next charge, but Punk was selling the post, and he didn't need to be there that quick. So he should really put his follow-through a little bit better. Anyway, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it, it, they went back and forth. Everything worked. Everything looked good. And then finally, 
Starks hits an Alabama slam, gets a two count. And as they're coming up, they bump the in-ring referee. And Starks top spreads Punk and puts his feet on the ropes, but Steamboat on the floor knocks the feet off the ropes. So Starks turns around like, what the fuck are you doing? And at that point, Punk schoolboys him, and Steamboat rolls in and counts one, two, three. And that was a great, that, the finish was fine because that's a special referee and you're making use of him. I still can't figure out why Ricky couldn't have been in the ring up until then. I think it would have flowed a little better. But maybe he's got some kind of insurance requirements or whatever for his his hospitalization or whatever he had. Maybe he's got a policy with fucking um, uh, yeah, Lloyds of London. What'd you think of this match? I thought it was all right. Yeah, I really can't add too much to what you say. It got sloppy at a couple different points, but... I thought it was all right. As far as Steamboat, obviously they did the referee bump. They got him involved in the ring. It was either they wanted to do that spot really, really badly, or there's a reason Steamboat wasn't going to work the whole match. I mean, he looks like he's in great shape. I think he may have had some, if not heart issues, he's had issues in the past with something. No, he, he was doing something with the WWE and had a some kind of either concussion or brain thing or whatever and that's why they you know he hasn't worked but what i'm saying is i think he should have been under even when they bumped the referee if ricky could have rolled in then to take over and starks does the top spread with the feet he could have done it from inside the ring it it took a second it i think the pop would have come a little louder and a little quicker if as soon as the schoolboy happened if if ricky had been there instead of having to roll in but anyway, the point is, now we got to do some business. So as Steamboat hands Punk the belt, and Punk holds his arm up and hugs him, Starks comes from behind and blisters Steamboat, and Steamboat knocks Punk off the ring. That was a nice little bing-bing. So that, and, and at the same time, Ricky didn't have to take a bump. He just went into Punk. Punk took the bump, and Ricky crumpled. And then Starks got on Steamboat, and the punches were weak, but I understand. I'm not taking off any points for that. But he got uh, Ricky's belt off and started whipping him with it. And that's what they wanted, because Steamboat got to do the Ricky Steamboat selling with the body language, cringing, and the facials. He's not taking a bump, but he's doing the selling of the pain, which he was noted for. And that was brilliant. You see it? It's like when Buster Keaton would be in a 1950s TV show and you'd get a chance to see a master at work from 30 years previously. And then Punk comes in with a chair and runs Starks off and great deal because nothing settled. You know, Starks cheated, but Punk took advantage of a situation. Nobody's been beat flat. Uh, Starks was the heel when he left because he was beating up Ricky Steamboat in South Carolina. And then the people were chanting CM Punk, CM Punk. So that they can they can change course in mid in midstream. The punches looked like shit. Yes, but it's Steamboat and he had a brain hemorrhage or whatever. Hey, listen, he's so good at selling Starks had heat with me by the end of it. Yeah, but I, th I think actually he probably should have just not done punches. And so a couple of stomps would have been sufficient. The fact that they did this to Steamboat. I mean, Steamboat has to appear on TV again. This isn't a one-off thing, you would think, right? Well, I don't know, to be honest, because. I mean, it, 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 it served a purpose in that. Punk gets a win back over Starks, but settles nothing, and it didn't diminish Starks. They were in the Carolinas. Steamboat works there for the live audience. I don't know if you want to bring him back and program him. You know, unless there's, a, I mean, another interview appearance or something else where, you know, Starks might get involved with him or whatever, but I don't think it's going to be an ongoing situation. I don't think it's called for again, but if they have an idea in mind, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I don't think it's going to go on long term. All right. Well, that was collision. 
And we collided with collision. But you know what, Brian? The thing is, at this point in time, it's a Saturday night, and now it's it's past 10 o'clock Eastern time. And we've still got SummerSlam to go. It's time to start drinking. Because you got to modify your mood. You got to modify your mood. You got to give yourself a little hope to go on. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking about the strong stuff, folks. I'm not talking about going out and getting some of the old homicide, that 150 proof stuff. I'm not talking about setting fire to some Everclear. I'm talking about enjoyable, sociable, alcoholic beverages for adults in the way of wine, personalized wine boxes delivered on your schedule to your home, to your taste and your preferences, courtesy of our brand new friends at First Leaf. Now, I know when you, when you hear First Leaf, you might think that they're involved in some other kind of business like gardening, but that is not the case, folks. You love First Leaf because they make it super easy to get personalized wine boxes delivered on my skin. When you pull the wine out of the box, Brian, you'll see it's personalized. It has Brian Last or Jim Cornette or whatever your name is right on the bottle. And it says Vintage Tuesday. Keep going. I want to see where else you're going to go with this. Well, see, that's the box that I, I think they just got me a special box. Really? That's what it is. That's very nice. But no, su it's summertime. Yes. And you got you got family fun going on, family vacations, camping trips, pool parties, barbecues. And if you're going to have that many kids around you, you've got to have alcohol in stock. For all the adults, you got to have some great wine at the ready and plenty of it, folks. So uh, right now, the people at First Leaf are stomping the grapes just for you. And they're getting all these rosés and white wines and terrific reds and sparkling pinks and all the different kinds of wine and what you do is you go to try try firstleaf.com try firstleaf.com and you just answer questions about your likes and dislikes what you like the taste of what you don't for example if you like the sparkling wines and the rosés and the the various fruity flavors you would say that if if you don't like the taste of battery acid, put that down. They will not send you any wine with battery acid in it. That's a guarantee. Yes, because they, they don't want to send you anything you don't want. They're big on customer service. But again, if, if you want battery acid, I guess they'll do their best. But m most Surgeon no. Generals over the last 20 years have, have recommended you cut down on your consumption of battery acid. I'm pretty sure the side effects of death may prevent them from using battery acid in any of the wonderful wines you can get from tryfirstleaf.com, of course, slash JCE. Wonderful reds and whites and all sorts of other yes. things you can get. Colors, all the colors of the rainbow. And and you're right, acid is somewhat, does have implications on your health. Do they have any blue wine? There's no blue food. I've seen sparkling pinks and rosés and reds and whites, but is there blue wine? Seems like with the blueberries and the raspberries, you'd have the blues and the purples. We'll come back to that. Again, it's tryfirstleaf.com slash JCE because you got to slash that JCE because when you sign up, you're going to get your first six hand-curated bottles of any type of wine that you want for just $44.95. Your personalized wine shipments are delivered right to your door. So you, and be careful now, keep an eye out because you can schedule these things when you want them. Let's say you're going to go out, visit your parole officer. You're afraid that the wine is going to come while you're gone and some porch pirate or turd burglar or whoever they are is going to steal it. Well, no, because you can schedule these the day that you're in home car incarcerated, so you will not miss the delivery. And you can just kick back and enjoy them right there. Everybody wants to be a wino, and every selection is backed by First Leaf's 100% satisfaction guarantee. So go to tryfirstleaf.com slash JCE. When you sign up, you're going to get your first six hand curated bottles for just $44.95. They hand curate the bottles, Brian, but the wine, they just get a big vat and they just kind of get a, 
one of those funnels and just pour the wine out of the vat into all the different hand curated bottles. But it, it's delicious. It's delicious and there's no big vat involved. It's big well, taste what, and wonderful wine coming to you from tryfirstleaf.com slash well, JCE. It, if the wine is hand curated, wouldn't they say six hand curated bottles of wine instead of just six hand curated bottles? Am I playing semantics here with their curation? Possibly. Well, therefore, folks, check it out for yourself. Make your own decisions. You be the judge. Try firstleaf.com slash JCE. You're going to get your first six bottles for under $8 a bottle. My God, that's cheaper than Thunderbird. That's cheaper than Ripple. Do you know what you get, Brian, when you cross eggnog with Ripple? No. Egg nipple. Do you know what you get when you cross <laughs> champagne with Ripple? No, what? Shampipple. <laughs> Tryfirstleaf.com slash JCE. But are they drinking plenty of wine over there at the Arcadian Vanguard Network these days, Brian? Some of the hosts are. Some of them aren't. But we will not disclose that here. But you can find out more on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network and information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. It's one of those moments, I don't know if there's too much noise behind me or no noise behind me. I hear nothing. Well, then I speak of nothing, but let me tell you about what's going on this week. Of course, the wrestling news each and every day. Get your free daily wrestling newscast. All the news, none of the opinion. Get it today for free. TheWrestlingNews.com or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Look for Arcadian Vanguard's the wrestling news want to make mention of this week's episode of shut up and wrestle with brian solomon his guest jessica the daughter of bobby the brain heenan yes i i retweeted this i haven't had a chance to listen but i want to we want to thank paul Heyman for helping promote it this week <laughs> but here the daughter of the brain hear all about bobby the brain heenan the man outside the ring check this out today a really great episode suawpod.com or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts and of course the 605 Super Podcast The Mothership mm. Go through the archive today at 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcasts The Mothership